Well, we're going to start a study on which I've entitled The Problem of Pain. And we're going to have a look at suffering. It's a big topic and it cannot be done in one or two weeks. So we will take some time over it. Uh, but before we start the topic itself, I would like just to read some passages from Scripture. So I'll just read three different passages to start with, but I will be quoting from other scriptures as we go through the evening. Let's start with Job. Job chapter 14, verses 1 and 2. In many ways, this sets a theme for the meeting. Man that is born of a woman is of few days and full of trouble. He cometh forth like a flower and is cut down. He fleeth also as a shadow and continues not. We will turn to Genesis chapter 3 and look at verses 16 to 19 as well. And to the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be in thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam, he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. And thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And finally, Romans 8, verses 20 to 22. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Well, as I've mentioned, we are starting a new series this evening on the subject of suffering. I've entitled the work The Problem of Pain, partly after work by C.S. Lewis, um, which I have borrowed a number of ideas from, but I haven't uncritically taken ideas from C.S. Lewis, but there are, for the, because there are some places where we're going to differ. I've also given a subtitle to the work. Why is there suffering in God's world? The intention is to understand specifically why suffering is to be found in a world created by an all powerful, all wise and perfectly good God. First, I would like to ask a simple question. Why should we look at the subject? Well, we do want to be able to give an answer to those who ask questions about the faith. In the, in the modern world in which we live, it seems that people find an objection to an all good God in suffering. We need to be able to explain why there is suffering in this world. But there is a more practical reason, a more personal reason for studying suffering that each of us needs to face up to. If we have not already suffered, or if we are not suffering at present, then the truth is we will suffer one day. Suffering is part and parcel, it seems, of human life. In such times, 
of suffering, we will need to stand. For it's in these times that we can expect our adversary, the devil, to shoot fiery darts at us. And I don't think we should underestimate the great spiritual damage that can be in, that can be inflicted on us if we are unprepared for such times. Even if we are not suffering at present, we are going to meet people who suffer. And we have to have a framework to help them as well. So I think those are some very good reasons why we should look at suffering. Augustine, the church father, in his commentary on Psalm 66, warns of people who, when all goes well with them, fail to take the opportunity to spiritually prepare for the difficult times that they will inevitably face. He writes, and if you want to read this quote, I will uh, share it after the meeting. Such a person has not imitated the ant by collecting seeds while it was still summer. What do I mean by that? Asks Augustine, while it was still summer. When his life was tranquil, while worldly prosperity was his lot, when he had leisure, when everyone deemed him fortunate, it was summertime for him. If he had listened then to the word of God, collecting grains and storing them within, he would have been following the example of the ants. Troubles might then have overtaken him to put him to the test as though the frozen apathy of winter or a storm of fear or a cold snap of sadness had overtaken him. It could have been some loss of fortune or a threat to his health or the death of a dear one, some disgrace or humiliation. Then it would have been winter for him. But the ant falls back on what it collected in the summer. And then within, in its private place, when no one sees it, the ant is refreshed by the fruits of its summer toil. While it was collecting these items during the summer, it was obvious to the onlookers, but when it feeds on them in the winter, no one sees. Let us apply Augustine's illustration to ourselves. If all is going well, make every effort to benefit from God's word so that we may have something to fall back into, back onto when the cold wind of suffering blows upon our life. May we meditate carefully on this theme that we might have something to feed upon in our inevitable winter time. Now the theme we are looking at will take several weeks to cover. Do not think that all that can be said can be said in one evening. It will not. Please patiently take all the talks together to get a good overview of the subject. The Christian faith cannot be taught in one Bible study, one lecture, one discussion, or one sermon. A certain patience is necessary, and this evening will simply be a brief introduction to the subject. Now, we are often assured by atheists that suffering is not something that we would expect if God exists. Therefore, you might think that where greater suffering is to be found in the world, it is there that you will find fewer believers in God. And conversely, you might think if that was true, where there is less suffering, at that place there will be more believers in God. But that appears to be the reverse of the truth. It is an undisputable fact that though life was for most people in human history very much harder than it is for us modern Western people, they were far more likely 
to believe in a good God than we are. Religious belief only declined as modern medicine, technology, together with social and political stability, have made life easier and greatly mitigated suffering. We might want to reflect on why that is as we go through these studies. C.S. Lewis, in his book, The Problem of Pain, explains that when he was an atheist, and C.S. Lewis was an atheist at one stage, he considered suffering and pain to be a reason to reject God. After commenting in his book on the cycle of pain and suffering seen throughout the world, he concludes his thoughts from those atheistic days. All stories will come to nothing. All life will turn out in the end to have been transistory and senseless contortion upon the idiotic face of infinite matter. If you ask me to believe that this is the work of a benevolent and omnipotent spirit, I believe all the evidence points in the opposite direction. Either, so we thought, there is no spirit behind the universe, or spirit indifferent to good and evil, or else an evil spirit. Obviously, C.S. Lewis came to completely change his mind. But here is a peculiar thing. Those who do not suffer and contemplate suffering from afar cannot see a good God. But it seems that those who experience or are likely to experience suffering are far more likely to turn to God. Now, there is a retort that you might hear. The atheist is likely to respond that people who suffer are more likely to believe in God because they hope he will rescue them from, or at least reward them for their suffering. But how does that sit with the atheist's other claim that if God exists, we should not expect him to be willing and uh, that we should expect him to be willing and able to eliminate sin and suffering. When human leaders show indifference or incompetence, does that tend to make people more inclined to trust or believe in them? Quite the opposite. So if people of earlier generations assumed, like the atheist does, that a good God would eliminate all suffering, wouldn't the persistence of suffering have caused them to doubt God? rather than to believe in him more fervently. The fact is that earlier generations did not suppose that a good and omnipotent, all-powerful God would eliminate all suffering. Indeed, the very idea is contrary to Christian doctrine, which teaches that much suffering is precisely what we should expect in human life the pervasiveness of sufferings, if anything, actually confirms rather than falsifies Christianity. And bafflement at suffering is more a consequence of modern unbelief than a cause of it. What we're going to do then is to rightly reflect on pain and suffering. Perhaps even before we do that and try to pull these thoughts together, we should ask a very simple question. What is pain? What is suffering? So it's a very simple question, and perhaps you might think it's a very obvious answer to it. Well, perhaps in part there is. Suffering is not always seen on the surface, though, is it? There are obvious evils that can befall us in life, and... Can I just list a few of those evils that may befall us? Bodily disease of ourselves or those close to us. Think of cancer. Think of heart failure. Stroke. The coronavirus. Injury as well might occur to us. Injury caused by accident or even the deliberate intent of another person. Mm -hmm. Financial loss is suffering. Death of friends and relatives is a cause of suffering. Social exclusion, being cut off 
from society in some way, being cut off from family in some way, is suffering, loss of friends, loss of family, unjust accusations, you are falsely accused, suffering. If you consider the sufferings of Job, then it's quite obvious that he suffered many of the above. Death of his children, all his children, estrangement from his wife, complete financial ruin, ill health, and then unjust accusations from his friends. But there are other ways in which we suffer which are more invisible. For example, there are those who suffer with psychological illness, such as depression, or they may have bipolar, or they may suffer with, or you might suffer with severe anxiety, anxiety attacks. Sometimes, sadly, there's a tendency to be less sympathetic to people who suffer in such ways, but I think that's a prejudice that we need to realize is badly misplaced. It seems that people, some people, are more predisposed to these conditions than others. But these conditions, which I've outlined, can also to some degree accompany or follow the first list and create a perfect storm in your life. Financial loss, the loss of a friend, death, doesn't that bring depression? I do not think it is hard for us or surprising to recognize that Job too suffered psychologically. In fact, perhaps that's the most bitter way in which he suffered. Think of one of his laments, but you can turn to the book of Job and find many more. In Job 3, he describes how he feels. Job 3, verse 16. Why died I not from the womb? Why did I not give up the ghost when I came out of the belly? His condition was such that he wished that he had never lived, that he had been stillborn, born dead into the world. That was his agony. If we were not reasoning, feeling beings, then suffering would be mitigated. But it is because we reason, because we feel, that pain and suffering can be so fearful to us. Suffering, we say, is part of the human condition. To quote those words which we read from Job earlier, Job 14 verses 1 and 2, man that is born of woman is of few days and full of trouble. He comes forth like a flower and is cut down. He flees also as a shadow and continues not. Suffering is part and parcel, it seems, of human life. And as much as we try to miss it and avoid it and escape it, inevitably at some point it will catch up with us. Let's move on and try to start answering the child's question, but it's the question that we all have. Why suffering? Why is there so much suffering and pain in the world? Why do I suffer? Why do others suffer? This evening, I can only give a very short answer. It's going to be incomplete. So we need to listen over the next few weeks to get a full picture. But the short answer is quite simply the fall of man into sin. If you know the shorter catechism, then those very words are part of an answer. The fall of man into a state of sin and misery. The two things, sin and misery, go together and cannot be separated. And in a sense, that is the answer to suffering in the world. That's the short answer. Adam and Eve, in their state of innocence, did not suffer pain as we suffer pain. They did not have suffering, but the fall brought about massive changes within man, in his relationships to the natural world, and obviously in his relationship to God. Now, it's not my purpose tonight 
to look at all the ramifications of fall. That's not what I intend to do. I only want to look at those that are pertinent to our topic. The fall changed man's relationship to God. And that's important when we consider suffering. Before the fall, Adam was the friend of God. He walked with God in the garden. In God, Adam found his ultimate satisfaction and rest. After the fall, Adam is a lawbreaker who hides from God. Adam dies spiritually in the garden. And this is exactly what God warned Adam would happen. Essentially, that means Adam now found, finds himself opposed to God. Spiritually, he dies and is no longer able or willing to please God. This introduces an instant psychological, well, I'm going to use the word paradox, I can't think of another one, within Adam. He was created to find satisfaction in God. Only in God is true rest for our soul. And that doesn't change, not even after the fall. And to quote Augustine, our heart is restless until it finds rest in thee. <laughs> However, what changes is this. Adam now stands spiritually opposed to that which will give, that which alone can give him life. That which alone can give him rest. Adam at the same time despises. He hates that which alone can give him rest of heart. Although God can be his only good, he at the same time finds himself to be the enemy of God. He, in other words, will never find rest. The rest is in God, but to God, he will not go. Adam, from now on, is bound to be miserable for that reason alone. There is no alternative. Also, of course, all of us, his posterity, are affected in the same way. And incidentally, the only way in which this can be dealt with by God is by making us a new within, by regenerating us, if you want the theological term. But again, that is for another time. There were other inevitable changes which brought suffering and pain in their wake. The fall brought spiritual death, death as Adam was warned, but also the inevitable physical disillusion of the body would follow. I mean physical death, the death of our bodies. And not just the death of the body, all the processes that lead up to that. The degeneration of our organs, the susceptibility that we now all have to disease and injury are the results of Adam's fall. Suffering, we must say, is also introduced because God curses the ground because of Adam's sin. Genesis 3, verses 17 to 19. Let's just go back to those verses. And unto Adam, God says, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. And thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, and to, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. From now on, work is going to be a struggle, and it will not always yield the hope for return. Some Effort expended in work will be in vain. Crops may fail. 
with all the implications that brings for life. Another example, learning is going to be difficult. It's not always going to be easy. It's going to be difficult. It won't always be successful or pleasant. Mistakes are going to be made. It's all part of the consequence of Adam's fall. We could say more about that, but we need to move on. Let's think about Eve. What does the Lord say to Eve? I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. The difficulties, the pain associated with childbirth and child rearing can be laid at the door of the fall. The last words of these, this verse too, he shall rule over you, referring to the husband. Here probably refers to the unjust rule by force, brutal rule that some men impose on a wise rather than the natural order of love and headship that was part of the created order. It's been corrupted, twisted, changed. And here we would think of the sin of spousal abuse, a man beating up his wife, <coughs> or <coughs> harming her psychologically. Now the verse does not condone this at all. But this is what's going to happen as a result of the introduction of sin into the world. Sin will bring suffering and it will permeate throughout all human relationships. The fall introduces all sorts of harm into the world. The fall opened Pandora's box. And incidentally, Pandora, according to Greek mythology, was the first woman on earth who, opening the box, introduced illness and hardship into the world. I suppose that's a useful picture of Eve. Eve is Pandora. She opened the box of suffering. Paul makes clear that the curse affects creation until the last day. Paul comments in Romans 8, that the whole of creation is presently held under bondage of corruption, waiting the day of Christ's return. Listen again to Romans 8, verse 20 to 22. For the creature, creature here meaning the whole creation, was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him, who hath subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also should be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Now, of course, Paul also in those verses declares the time will come when the subject subject into vanity futility, if you prefer, will be brought to an end. But for now, let us remember that Adam's fall has had consequences for the whole world in which we live. Look at the words which Paul used to describe the current state of creation. Vanity, futility, corruption, groaning and travailing in pain. The fall introduced all of this into creation. Perhaps back to the psychological impacts of the fall. They may run deeper than I suggested. I'm not sure that we fully understand them or are able to express them. C.S. Lewis suggests that the relationship between our spirit and our body were disrupted after the fall. And I'm sure that's true. So that now bodily desires have much more power. Desires, if you like, of our animal nature, for want of a better expression, force themselves into our mind and will, which are now ready to indulge them. Have you not ever found that your body has moved you in some sinful way and suddenly a weak, 
a weak will succumbs to it. Well, all due to the fall. Adam, with his sin, opened up a polluted fountain. And from fallen nature, including my own sin, has continued to flow. We need to face the consequences of our sinful behavior, which are also snowballs and has ramifications no less than Adam's sin. Let's think about our own sin or sin more generally. Am I a liar? I hope that's not true of anybody. But if I'm a liar, others will rightfully distrust me. On the other hand, others may follow my example and lie. Now, children are very good at imitating, mimicking, and they will mimic their parents and they will mimic their sins. How parents, how careful parents need to be when they give an example to their children. But lying brings suffering. Obvious examples. Should I abuse drugs? How foolish. But I may become an addict if I so do. That's suffering. And it may also mean I lose my job and I lose my friends. I lose my family. I lose my home. Am I so foolish as to commit adultery? Then no, it will cause the breakup of marriage. It'll break up my marriage. It'll break up the marriage of the person with whom I commit the sin. And in so doing, how many others do I harm? How many children are made unhappy by such sins? And yet, that would be common in our day and age. And of course, we can actually keep on multiplying examples where sin introduces suffering. And the fall is the fountain from where all of this misery has come and will continue to flow until all things are made new. Now, the complicated, the complex interconnectedness of human relationships is such that as we continue to commit these and many other sins, that that misery sin engenders can only pervade and spread throughout society affecting all. Sin does affect us all. Sin and misery are so intertwined that we are all in a web. The human race becomes most miserable. You can say that temptation to sin can look so pleasant and most advantageous to us, and surely did to Eve on that fateful day, but how bitter are the fruits and how far they reach? How long and how far can the bitter ramifications of sin be felt? In order to deal with suffering, God must also deal with the root cause. And this God will do at the restoration of all things when Christ returns. Now, God is working in this order, this current world, bringing good out of evil, good out of suffering. Nowhere is this more clearly seen than in the death of our, Jesus, of our Lord Jesus Christ. For the sufferings of the death of Jesus Christ are followed by the resurrection on the third day. And in the sufferings of Christ and in his resurrection lies our hope. Our hope is bound up with the sufferings of the perfect man. That is something which we're going to think about and expand at another time. But this evening, we have tried to understand why things are the way they are. Why suffering is part of the human condition. Christianity accounts for the way things are. But so much more needs to be said. I do not wish to imply that if a person suffers, it must be because they sinned the week before, or sinned terribly in their life. That's not what I'm trying to say tonight. But I'm trying to actually just explain why suffering and misery have entered the world. And it is simply sin. But the sin and the suffering spread. 
So we need to think more about the subject. What I would like to do next, next week, is to consider the goodness of God and the sovereignty of God in relationship to evil. Why doesn't God just stop evil? More importantly, we need to think about the revelation of Jesus Christ and how that changes our perception to suffering. The latter I've already hinted at. We also should consider how we should react to pain and suffering when they come our way. How prepared are we going to be? How should we react to say pain? Using Augustine's metaphor, let us make sure that we start laying up that which will give us strength in times of trial. We also need to spend some time considering the distant difference between chastising and punishing. There is a world of difference between those two words, and we need to consider that. There's much more that we need to think about when we look at suffering. And we will do that in subsequent weeks, God willing. Shall we just pray together? Heavenly Father and Lord God, as we come before thee now, we would come before thee humbly, for we realise that sin has entered in the world through our first father, Adam. And from that fountain, all sins have flowed. And we also know from that fountain has come all the misery of the human race. We do not pretend to understand these things thoroughly, but we acknowledge that, uh, that we are not what we ought to be. And Lord God, in many ways, suffering is the deserved lot of the human race. But we thank thee that in the sufferings of Jesus Christ, we have the reason for hope. We thank thee that in his sufferings, we have the forgiveness of sins. And we can look forward to a time when we will be in thy presence mm. and will know thee, that thou will wash away every tear and thou will wipe them away from our eyes. All those reasons now for misery will be removed. Help us, Lord God, to look forward to that day and help us to live in the light of the knowledge of it. It will surely come. Oh God, may we put our hope in thee, we ask. Be with us in the rest of this evening in our discussions and in our fellowship and our chatting together, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.